just like good old Sarah Palin. I can see Russia from my house. I guess you'd had to be around during one of the election cycles to know exactly what that is. Gonzo, the Coast Guard years. New York, episode three. Pizza in the USO. As it turns out, the guy that blurted out, how do you not know that? That's like the most basic thing you should know if you're going to be an ET. Well, that dude was a former Navy dude. He spent most of his naval career on a NOAA ship, which stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or rather the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So NOAA, N-O-A-A. So Mr. Former Navy blurdy boy was an E.T. on this NOAA ship. So basically he was already an E.T. His situation was, well, I think his situation was a little different on how he joined the Coast Guard. Uh, he ended up losing rank uh, during the transition from the Navy to the Coast Guard. So he basically had to do the whole process all over again. It sucks for him. I mean, why the hell would he put himself through all that? You never know what people will do to to join the Coast Guard. Yes, lots of people do weird things like Marines join the Coast Guard, mostly Army people. Oh, and in Air Force, too. And I do have a story about, well, a story I heard from a guy who's former Air Force and then joined the Coast Guard, but you probably won't believe me. But I'm going to tell you that story at some point if I remember. So, you know, I never asked a guy why he joined the Coast Guard I don't know. I guess I guess everybody joins the Coast Guard thing. It's easier. And maybe from a sort of rank structure type thing, maybe it was easier. I mean, it was a, a lot more laid back, I think. While he and I were the same rank or um, we were both E3s, he was several years older than I was. Oh, and he had a big bushy ass mustache that all the Coasties who, who grew a mustache grew. I mean, I know... I, I have no idea what people were thinking growing those big bushy mustaches. It made no sense to me. So we had some interesting people in our class and, and the class ahead of us as well. For the most part, though, we all had gotten along pretty well, much like on ships or small boat stations uh, where we all came from. Although I think one guy came from an isolated duty station. And I'm pretty sure he did. And I'm, uh, I think it was at to Alaska. And without me looking it up, I kind of know where it is. Um, it is the last island in the Aleutian Island chain. I'll say that's about all that I knew about it. I mean, I had heard of it. I mean, who hadn't if you were in the Coast Guard? Honestly, uh, I think half the shit that I thought I knew was bullshit anyways, except for the fact that I had no business actually being in AT school. But that's a whole different story. So add to a... Um, Alaska Atu Island, the base, was a Loran Sea Station. It was on the Aleutian Island chain, and it was the last island, as I said, uh, in the chain as well. It was so far west that I think, just like good old Sarah Palin, I can see Russia from my house. I guess you'd had to be around during one of the election cycles to know exactly what that is. Presidential election, election cycles, that is. Which, if you lived on Attu Station, you probably could see Russia because it one of the neighboring islands was right there. And you're probably also wondering, what's Loran? Loran is short for Long Range Navigation. That seems pretty easy. L-O, Long, R-A, Range, and the N is for Navigation. I, I, I'm sure um, I might have this wrong, but... Um, the basic concept of Loran was that radio signals were like being broadcast. And this happened through a number of Loran stations uh, around the globe. And so basically a ship would triangulate. That's a big word for me. Would triangulate the position based on those, um, those, those, those radio signals and Coast Guard ships. And actually a bunch of ships during that time frame had uh, Loran receivers. Now, the Coast Guard took over Loran from the Navy and the Air Force. There was first Loran A, then Loran B, which the Navy was working on. The Air Force was working on Loran C, which was eventually took, taken over by the Navy. 
And then, of course, they transitioned all of that to the U.S. Coast Guard. So at to Alaska, the Coast Guard, I think, left there in 2010. Man, that's a long time ago, considering the time of this particular recording, which sometime in February of 2023. That was a long time ago. But so the replacement of Loran was, uh, I suppose you're aware, is uh, GPS. So it's because of GPS that Loran uh, was no longer needed. I mean, it makes sense. It was expensive and probably not all that accurate compared to, Lor um, I mean, compared to GPS. So after class, I'm totally switch switching gears on you guys. After class, we would spend most of our, our, our time off in, in various pastimes, one of which was spent in the lounge in the barracks. The lounge was usually empty except during evening hours because we were all supposed to be in class. So, of course, it would be empty after class. And it, unless you're going in the city, you didn't have much else to do. And hanging out when I mean, we were in New York. So the weekends, we definitely spent a lot of time uh, in, in, in the city. The, the weird thing, and I shouldn't say the weird thing, but the thing about um, being at this school, it was just like being on, like, again, like, like I said, on the ship or uh, on one of the small boat stations. There were so many, many of us from different walks of life. It was really kind of cool in, in its weird sort of way. Uh, but most of us had at least would say we are a little salty uh, and not like you know, grumpy or snippy, like the kids are saying today. If you're in the Coast Guard or Navy, if you spend any time out in the fleet, probably earn the right to say you're a little salty. Uh, so that was a, one thing we actually all had in common was we'd all been out in the fleet before. Even Mr. Blurdy, blurdy out loud dude. And, and I guess being salty and, and, and is one of those things that we, we all had in common and it made it much easier for us to get along because we all had some sort of shared story at this point. It doesn't mean that some of the guys weren't flaming assholes because we did have some assholes out there in our group. And um, they're everywhere, you guys. You just can't get around them. When the occasion arose and we all hung out in the lounge, which was basically a big ass room, it had some couches, some chairs. And God, and the furniture was like ridiculously ugly. And there are all kinds of stains on it. And I, I imagine that it's just like food stains and drink stains and not the other kind of stains, which I won't talk about. It had this tiny little television that sat on, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know a, a, a rickety old like TV stand, had a, a few coffee tables, you know, kind of thrown around. It's not like we actually sat there and drank coffee because, well, there were no coffee machines in the barracks. You had to go to the chow line, which was a whole separate building. So, but we, I mean, we did have food in there, just not all that often. So you, usually we were hanging around um, the, the lounge when, you know, we, we were super bored or you were done with like whatever your homework you might have had, which we didn't have a whole lot of that or studying. There was a sporting event on TV. We would definitely watch some of those. And, and usually when we were there, it, it always sometimes magically turned into pizza night. And the, the only, I shouldn't say the only place, but the closest place to get pizza, and it was quite good actually, uh, and the only place that we could agree on was pizza at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Man, that stuff is, so, I, yeah. I should go to New York now, now and just go, go, go to that place if it's, if it's still there. The Staten Island, um, it's, it was actually the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. So there's a pizza place uh, right there in the mainland of New York and not actually over in Staten Island. So if you really wanted pizza, it was a trip. You had to walk 10 or 15 minutes from the barracks to the Coast Guard Ferry and then wait for the ferry if you didn't catch it on time and then take like the 10 or 15 minute trip across the water to actually get to the mainland. And then it's like a few minutes from, I don't know, it's probably five, less than five minutes to walk to the pizza place. And then you stand in line, you get your order. And incidentally, people didn't call it pizza. I think they called it like a pizza pie. Uh, so I guess it was a pie, I mean a pizza, but 
Everyone would say I, I needed a pie. I needed a pizza pie. I, I, maybe I got that wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm confusing with the craziness from the people in uh, other parts of New England. Massachusetts actually is what I'm thinking about. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, uh, I'm, I, I don't know why they call it a pie other than the fact that it was round. And uh, I think that was about it. I mean, and, oh, and, uh, oh, now I'm thinking about apple pie. The pizza, I mean, have you ever had New York style pizza? Th this stuff was amazing. Um, I mean, oh God. So apple pie, you get apple pie, but do you get pepperoni pie? No, you get pepperoni pizza. Yeah, I, um, this is weird. Anyway, what what the hell do I know? I, I mean, I grew up in Virginia. So anyway, after you stood in line, you got your pizza, then it, you had to do the whole reverse trip all over again. And that could take about... 45 minutes ish. If you're, if you, if you hit everything just right, it's probably about a half an hour. If you were lucky, that's if you were walking back from the, the pizza place and you caught the train right as not the train, the, the ferry, right as the ferry showed up and you got on, you took the trip across and then you had to walk from the ferry back to um, the, the barracks. Now you may find this surprising, but, um, I didn't mind actually going to get the pizza. Uh, and, and one of the reasons was that there, there was this like common rule. Someone would say, I buy you fly, which basically meant somebody else was paying for the pizza. All I had to do was go get it. So there always, there would always be a number of people that would, you know, chip in. And of course it was usually more than one person that actually went to go get the pizza or pie. There'd be like, we'd have to get like three or four of them because there was like a, a bunch of us that would sit around. Um, so yeah, three or four pizzas usually. Usually the, the trip there was uneventful and um, on the way back too, it was pretty uneventful. But I was always worried that it would just be my luck. There would be some kind of pizza disaster on the way back. I mean, can you imagine, you know, two or three dudes carrying three or four pizzas like a 15 minute walk at night and you can only, and if we had been drinking a little bit, it just made it worse. But, and, and also there was always this temptation when you're sitting on the ferry on the way back to like open the box and start eating. But you know, you would really piss off a bunch of people if you did that. So anyway, going to get the pizza was fine. Coming back. That was a stressful trip on the way back. And, and, and it, it always worked out. I don't ever remember there ever being an issue with uh, getting me getting back with the pizza. There may have been some other folks, but if you screwed up, I mean, you definitely were going to, have to pay for the next round of pizza. I didn't want to have to pay, so I almost always volunteered to go. And we, again, it wasn't just me that, that went. Um, it's not that I was cheap or anything, but, well, crap. You know, I didn't want to spend my money if I didn't have to. Somebody else was spending money. It was cool. Anyway, pizza night was always a good way to just, well, once it got back, it was a good stress reliever. Uh, yeah. But speaking of stress, ET class. Oh my God. That, that thing was, it was, it was fun at, at times, but it was also stressful at more times. We, we had a variety of different instructors and each one had obviously different personalities than the, than the previous ones or the other ones. And some of them, it was, it was just obvious they were super arrogant. And some of them acted like they didn't believe we were worthy enough even to be ETs in their precious Coast Guard. And the weird thing is that wasn't much different than the attitude for, I mean, from a couple of the guys on the Thetis when I was on there. They, they, they were kind of jerky boys. Yeah. Others, though, thought it was a cool opportunity to actually teach people what they knew. You know, it's kind of like passing on knowledge from the first from one generation to the next. So that was that was cool, and and you can tell they enjoyed actually teaching. But to be fair, I don't think I ever felt that any of the the instructors wanted any of us to fail, even if they looked down on us. I don't think they actually wanted us to fail. I I, I do think they generally wanted us to pass. It might have been that that passing each section that we were being taught. Uh, by different instructors probably reflected somehow on their own annual performance appraisal, which I had a couple of those in the Coast Guard. 
And that's that. Yeah, I had to remember to tell you guys about that. That my the last one I had was a doozy. Wow. Anyway, I might be wrong about the whole performance appraisal thing with the instructors, but as I got older, people kind of did things just to make sure that their performance appraisals were good. ET school started out with the basics of electronic theory and the flow of electronics and how different types of circuit configurations altered the flow of electronics and produced different types of results. However, the circuits which were designed by actual engineers did so in a way to produce an expected result. All that involved a higher level of math that I could never fathom. I mean, there were resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, transformers, potentiometer, diodes, IC chips, crystal oscillators, switches, relays, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm giving myself a headache. And you know what, though? I had to actually write all that stuff down um, so I wouldn't forget it as I'm doing this podcast or this, this, this thing so I wouldn't forget all those things. Spouting all of that stuff just really hurt my head. I think the moral of that was that there was a ton to learn and some level of basic math actually was needed or maybe rather just logical thinking was what was needed. I, I, I could think logically, but math, oh, Lord, no, I was terrible at that. So in the middle of all this stuff, you had to learn various types of test equipment to be used to determine what was broken uh, with a particular piece of equipment. And we had two main pieces of gear, a multimeter, which as the name implies did multiple things. Primarily we used it to measure voltage, whether, um, and whether it was DC or AC. I mean, you, you kind of had to know if it was DC or AC before you started monkeying around with, um, the multimeter. We also used that multimeter to measure resistance as well. And so again, you had to kind of know what you were doing with it before you actually did something. So yeah, we, so we used the multimeter uh, also to measure resistance. And in this case, resistance wasn't futile. You sci-fi nerds out there will get that reference. Or, yeah, sci-fi reference. Probably can't say the real thing. Anyway, okay. So the, 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 um, the instructors in every class gave you a piece of equipment that was uh, pretty much, it was like the, the, the case was taken off of it. It's like taking the case off your computer. Uh, but it wasn't a computer. There were like uh, many circuit boards, many, there are pieces of equipment that were supposed to do something. I, maybe one or two of them was maybe actually a radio at one point. I, I don't, I remember. But they gave you a piece of equipment with the guts exposed and they would walk you through the, the, the entire thing, or at least most of it, the areas that they needed you to focus on. And you take a bunch of notes to write down you know, the different measurements, because they make you take the measurements with the multimeter and also this thing called an oscilloscope as well. And so you would take measurements on the, the, the equipment and, you know, they would walk you through all this stuff. And it's not like they gave you a notebook and said, here, they know they made you do the work and then write it all down, um, which was kind of a pain in the ass, actually, to be, I mean, to be fair. Of course, you know, they would, they would want to check your, I mean, they actually gave you pieces of paper to write down the, stuff and they had blanks like you know go to this place and then write down the the, the stuff that you uh learned um if you and so then you'd have to like take that information to the instructors and if you got something wrong they'd send you back to uh, the equipment until you got it right of course they i mean they they help you through it and coach you through the answer again they these, these folks wanted you to pass and even if they thought you were idiots Thought I was an idiot, I guess. Um, but they still wanted you to try to actually get through it. All the different phases of ET school, at the end of each phase, you had to do what's called uh, a practical test. So, um, so you do you do like two, a week or two in a particular class, and at the end of that, you would have to take a practical test, and that basically meant that somebody would go in and um, they would break it, and you'd have to figure out what was wrong with it. Supposedly, with all the information you were taught, the notes and measurements you took on this piece of equipment, I, you know, I don't know um, about the other students, uh, but my, my notes were terrible. And my roommates, Rafa and Jim with the G, the morning of all these big tests, 
the, 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 the tests were all pass or fail. So you either got it right or you didn't. We had this ritual that w- that we did every morning. I mean, it was simple and it was probably lame, but any of you sports fans out there, whether you're watching or you were an athlete and you played when you, when you, when you did well, you know, you, 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 you had this ritual, the thing you always did to, to sort of, you know, help ensure whatever outcome it is that you're looking for. So again, we had a ritual too, and it's not like we did some weird dance or we were out running around with our underwear on backwards or anything like that. But then I have a story about people running around with their underwear on backwards, but I I digress. Um, We had one of those, it was a really old, it was an old digital clock even for us. Again, this was back in 1989, I think. So it was, it was damn old, but it had these big red letters. I swear if you probably got too close to it, you, you, you would probably get like a sunburn or something, or, or it would burn out your retina if you got too close to it. Uh, but we would sit there and we would wait, all three of us, till the clock hit 7, 11 a.m. I know it's silly, but that was our thing. And I'm not even sure what we expected to happen we didn't even know what, what, but if we didn't observe 7, 11 a.m., we were sure like the, the, the whole damn planet might explode if we didn't. And oh my God, I haven't watched 7, 11 or observed 7, 11 forever now. So maybe one, maybe, maybe Rafa and Jim are, are monitoring or observing 7, 11. So the whole planet doesn't blow up. But yeah, so, but it, at least, you know, when I was in school and we were observing, you know, 7-Eleven, you're welcome. We kept the plan from blowing up. So, I, you know what? I should get some kind of reward for that. And Jim and Rafa as well. So after we would sit there and, and observe 7-Eleven, the three of us would then haul ass to class and take uh, whatever our assigned seats were at the time for that class. And, and, and while we were being, let's say, engaging in, in increasing our chances of passing the instructor spent like the night before uh, preparing as well. And rather what they, again, what they did was they went and broke the equipment uh, that we've been, you know, been practicing and studying on and stuff like, and stuff like that. So now we had to use all the notes and the measurements we had taken and whatnot to figure out what was broken. Now, believe it or not, the, the basis of what we were expected to do to do as ETs was to fix shit that was broken. That and do with something that's called PMs. You did a lot of PMs when you were uh, in, 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 in ET in the Coast Guard. And PM means preventive maintenance. In a nutshell, it's kind of like what you do to your car. You take it occasionally for a tune-up, which is basically what ETs were expected to do when with our equipment. The Coast Guard just called it PM. PM's preventive maintenance. I guess preventive maintenance is sort of like a verb, I guess, not a thing. Anyway, so back to class. Typically, the first thing we did, we we turn on the gear and we see what we could see. And assuming you knew what the output measurements, you know, were were supposed to be, uh, you just started with there. And depending on that, you would work your way backwards, usually skipping a bunch of measurements. You know, basically, you would kind of leapfrog and try to make shortcuts uh, as you're doing your troubleshooting to figure out what was wrong and, and, and try to isolate where the issue was. Sometimes it was easy. And by easy, I mean, if you took proper notes, you can narrow down pretty quickly where you needed to focus your efforts. Sadly for me, as I said before, I rarely took good notes, not because I wasn't paying attention. I just had the hardest time staying focused. And of course I'd get lost. And then, then my notes were, were, were all over the fucking place. And during each practical, my anxieties were always would would freaking skyrocket. I didn't think I'd ever express to anyone that I was struggling, but thankfully though, I figured out early on that if I needed some help with note taking, um, that, um, my, my roommates were fabulous about that. I know Rafa and Jim both would review notes with me and basically to unfuck me, I guess. And sometimes, albeit infrequently, my notes would be most sometimes right. I should, I should say mostly, but sometimes right. So when our our, our, our days and evenings, um, class during the day, 
uh, lounge and pizza nights at night. As I mentioned previously, we were basically in New York City, just slightly removed from it. And we would go out into the big city and do most of the stuff uh, I, I, I never thought of that I would do. Hell, I mean, I, I was in a fairly rural area and hadn't experienced much at all. I think the first person I ever saw tipsy on alcohol might have been one of my parents. Uh, they were not heavy drinkers, particularly my mom. She like never drank, but when she did it, she, my, I'm so sorry, everybody, but my, my, my mom, her drink of choice was a fuzzy navel. Uh, I, I don't, oh, fucking hell, a fuzzy navel, really? I mean, I don't know, it, it, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm, mm, I, I'm embarrassed. I mean, it just sounds gross, doesn't it? Uh, speaking of drinking, I wasn't technically of legal age to drink either, uh, but that, 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 that never stopped me, at least not in New York. Now, Rafa, he was a, a way better person than me and had kept in touch with one of our friends um, from boot camp, Crosby, who was the guy from Nicaragua who was stationed on Governor's Island uh, after he left um, boot camp. I mean, if I recall correctly, Crosby was at a small boat station and doing real Coast Guard shit. Crosby also was living in the barracks there on Governor's Island, uh, not too far from where we were. I mean, in Governor's Island, it, I mean, by island standards, is not that big, but it's it was a pretty good sized base. So to walk from our barracks to his, it wasn't a short walk. Nah, it was a short walk, 10 or 15 minutes, I guess. But it was great being able to catch up with uh, Crosby and Rafa. And honestly, without them, I probably wouldn't have had experienced New York City uh, as I did or in the way that I did. Albeit, I experienced different things than, say, other Coasties I was in school with. I mean, I'd like to say I got some culture, 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 yeah, culture while I was there. And it wasn't just a complete drunk fest. I mean, it honestly, I, I did drink in New York, but um, I wasn't getting drunk like I just wasn't that just I hadn't yet, you know, gotten to that, you know, level in my uh, my 20s yet. Although, like I said, I did uh, admit to getting drunk, drunk on more than one occasion. Honestly, enough times that I can't actually remember how many times. Yeah, I do sound like an irresponsible kid now, which I suppose I was at the time. I always made it to class and I never failed a class while in ET school. So there's something so all you naysayers and party poopers out there, go suck it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Lighten about there, people. Most of the time, Crosby, Rafa, and I could go out at least once a week, sometimes more. We would head to Times Square um, and, and go to the United Services Organization, or USO for short. The USO, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, and I didn't actually, hell, I didn't know anything about, I mean, I'd seen signs before about the USO. I had heard about the USO from watching TV shows that were, that usually featured a guy named Bob Hope. Yeah, go, go ask your parents uh, who Bob Hope is, or actually you might have to go ask your grandparents. Bob Hope used to go and entertain uh, the troops overseas. Now, regardless of how someone might feel about the military or service members, by and large, those who were sent away from their family and friends, the USO was kind of cool. They we, they they took care of let's um, uh, they took care of the, the troops as best they could by doing some kind of entertainment. Again, Bob Hope, and occasionally I think they provided services um, to family members back home as well. If you have any friends in the military or family members in the military. The military life can really stress you the fuck out. For some of us, it was just a day job. For others, it was a bit more action-packed and or stressful. And the stress always kind of came in different sort of ways. My stressful time didn't really happen until I went on board my last duty station, which, of course, if you stick around, you'll hear about that eventually. Sorry about that. As usual, I kind of went off topic, took a detour, a little but. The point I was trying to get to is that the USO's mission is in large part to help military morale, which meant a few different things. Providing entertainment to service members who would go occasionally go to where their 
there wasn't a lot of entertainment, so they would go there and, and, and help entertain the troops. It also provided support to family members and servicemen as well. That sounded like a commercial. Uh, sorry about that, guys. What the USO did for Rafa, Crosby, and I was entertainment. The USO always had tickets to different types of Broadway and off-Broadway shows. I hadn't ever been to any kind of professional show. It, not, not that I can remember. It's not a live performance. You know, we used to, they had these shows back when I was in elementary school. And some guy would come in or gal and they would, you know, do like these puppet shows. Um, so I, I guess that's something, but not quite the same. Not the same caliber as Broadway and all Broadway shows. One of the things I guess was obvious to everyone except me was that you can't just stroll into a Broadway show dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. I mean, I guess you could and they probably wouldn't kick you out. But I mean, that basically was my everyday dress was you know, jeans and t-shirt. The reason I was wearing jeans, it's particularly in New York at the time, because it was kind of chilly when we got there, because we got there in January, January, February, March, April. Yeah. Anyway, maybe it was in February. I don't know. I, gosh, my time. I feel like I'd left sometime in May. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I, I didn't even own a warm coat beyond the, 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 the shit bag coat that the Coast Guard gave me. I don't know when or if I ever wore that coat. It, it, it had like this long faux fur lined thing. It was, oh. So Crosby and Raffle all agreed a wardrobe change was needed for Broadway shows. Um, so l- let me digress a bit here. Kind of, this is, I guess it's like, like a chicken and egg thing. I need to tell you about something before I get to like the other thing. I, I don't remember... Uh, if we went to a show first and then I decided or they decided that uh, um, I look too much like a back ass country hill fuck or something like that. Uh, regardless, the remedy was for Crosby to put his time uh, being in New York City to, to good use, at least to to, to dress me, I guess. Uh, he took Roth and I uh, clothes shopping in Greenwich Village. And we spent a lot of time in the village, mostly sightseeing, going to different restaurants, and which is really kind of cool. Although we always ended up at this one Mexican style restaurant. God, I wish I could remember the name of it. I, I don't even know if it's there anymore. I, I probably need to look. And I had a crush on one of the servers there. She had long, wavy hair, and she always had it in in a ponytail. Ooh, man. She, yeah, she, yeah, she definitely all, and she was really nice to us, um, but back, back to close. Um, the store Crosby took us looked like it had been someone's home, at least, uh, at least from the sidewalk. And I, I think all the shops on that particular street all kind of looked the same. There were a few things interesting about this shop. Uh, one of those things was that, in fact, it did have a doorbell you had to press. And the shopkeeper would basically decide if they wanted to let you in or not. Fortunately for us, the store attendant did let us in. I seem to recall he was sort of an average height and build and sporting a goatee or something like that. Or maybe it was a Van Dyke. I always get those confused. Regardless, Krause basically explained to the guy why we were uh, there. I think Rafa, or at least it was just me, was happy to let Crosby do all the talking for us. You know, I don't know about Rafa, but I, I was completely out of my element. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I don't, I don't remember when the last time I even, you know, I think I bought a pair of jeans at the Gap while I was in the Thetis. So yeah, I, yeah, clearly I had bought some jeans and some, and some Converse. I had these bright red Converse. Um, yeah. Uh, I was getting used though to to being on the the being in New York and getting used to riding the subway and not thinking that everyone on the subway was going to mug or kill me and, and, and leave me in the gutter somewhere or, or at least bleeding in, in, in the subway. At some point I, I, I did get, I, I did get handed a pair of black pants. And by the way, wh- why do they call it a pair of pants? It's only one pant, right? Like men wear a suit and here you go. Women can wear a pant suit, not a pants suit. That makes sense. God, man, I got issues. So anyway, I take the pants from Mr. Goatee and step inside the dressing room. 
It was only mildly larger than a phone booth, I think. And so remember I mentioned that this store was interesting. What I should have said, it was peculiar. The dressing room was wallpapered with pictures from magazines and maybe a few Polaroids as well. I, I didn't actually think that, um, I didn't think that, you know, it having pictures and magazine cutouts was, uh, was the peculiar part. However, the subject matter was, um, we'll just say unexpected. The dressing room, the dressing room was covered with pictures of naked men. Not just men, they were male porn stars with like the likes of John Holmes and Long Dong Silver and various other porn stars, I guess. Um, one of the pictures I remember had a caption on it, John Holmes is king. Pretty sure Elvis was the king, right? I mean, the whole dressing room was covered with these pictures. I mean, I was unaccustomed and wasn't sure how to react. So I acted like I hadn't seen it. I tried on the pants, Crosby and Rafa and Mr. Goatee wanted me to come out so they can see if the pants fit. So I came out, black pants on, Mr. Goatee asked me how it fit, told me to turn around, the black pants, the, the, the pants legs were too long, so he took out some pins and took out some Taylor's chalk and did his thing. This was all very new to me. Did I mention I was out of my element? You've been listening to Guns of the Coast Guard Ears Key West, written and produced by Tim Gonzalez, and I'm Nicholas Gonzalez, the voice guy. Join us next week for another episode of Gonzo of the Coast Guard Ears. 